Hi, my name is Brienne. I am autistic. I have ADHD. My pronouns are she, her, and I listen to My Chemical Romance on repeat so much I fear I'm on some sort of list. Uh, today is a solo dump because I am going to talk to you about the concept of a sensory diet. So if you are a new listener, usually these episodes have me with my girlfriend and co-host Violet talking about something that either one of us is super interested in or listening to a guest talk about something that is a special interest or hyperfixation. And this type of episode is where I go rogue and I go by myself and talk about something related to autism, neurodivergence, and taking care of your autistic brain. So if you haven't listened before, one of my, well, my main day job is an ADHD peer support and coaching provider. So this episode is partly so I can tell my clients like, hey, we don't have to spend an entire session's talk, session talking about sensory diets. I can just send them here to listen to that and they don't have to pay me for the entire session, which I know is not the best business, but I don't aspire to be good at business. So there you go. Uh, if you're one of my clients, hey, how's it going? So today we're going to be talking about a sensory diet. Before I knew I was autistic, as a teenager, I worked at a day center as a support provider for autistic kids, like mostly autistic kids. And you'd think I would have figured out I was autistic earlier because I, j I was good at my job. But um, one of the things I remember liking the most is when they would say, hey, we need someone to go to the sensory lab. And a sensory lab is kind of exactly what it sounds like, and it had a bunch of really great sensory stuff. And they would need someone in there to just help provide support to the kids who are in there to get some good sensory input. And very often, I would say a couple times a month, not super duper often, there would be an occupational therapist who would come in. And that's where I first kind of got the idea of filling someone's day with positive sensory input. So when I learned that I was autistic, I saw how much fun and how great this occupational therapist was with the kids when I was a teenager that I was like, okay, I need help figuring out how to take care of my own nervous system. Let me see if I can find some tools that occupational therapists use to help myself. And the one that helped me the most was learning about the concept of a sensory diet. And that's what we're going to talk about today. A sensory diet is a set of activities that aim to fill the person's day with the positive sensory input they need to help with nervous system regulation. And the idea of that is that it will, it will lessen the impact of negative sensory input and help you manage through some of the negative things you can't avoid in the first place. These tools can also be used when your sensory threshold has been passed and you are on the verge of a meltdown or a shutdown and you need some relief. This was additionally helpful for me because I know a lot of the resources I first saw when I first learned I was autistic are telling you to, you know, try out these stims, rediscover stims, use these stim toys, and when you are late recognized, you very often were actively discouraged or punished from doing behaviors that were stimming. I know I had a horrible time with memories of family members like my horrible grandma, rest in piss. So it is a tall order to ask someone to try out those stims again and see what comes naturally and see what helps when you have been actively traumatized out of using them. So the sensory diet was super helpful for me because it didn't require me to work through stuff I didn't have the capacity to work through yet, and I was able to access some relief when I was at the peak of my burnout. So the term sensory diet was coined by an occupational therapist named Patricia Wilbarger. These are usually really highly personalized plans an occupational therapist puts together for a person, but I know that not everyone has access to that kind of support, either, you know, monetarily or energy-wise. I know when autistic burnout is at its worst, just the idea of waking up and having to feed yourself again is exhausting. So having to contact some other support provider, that can be a barrier within itself. And I know a lot of people have trauma around finding different types of therapists. So I am not an occupational therapist. 
I do not play one on TV. I am just letting you know about something that you can try yourself, and if you find it helpful, you may want to go find an occupational therapist after you've experimented with some of that and see if they can help you further. And additionally, like any type of therapist or a coach or any sort of support provider, some are very, very good, and some are really neuroaffirming, and some are there to help you and not change you. And like any human being, some are capitalist dirtbags, and they won't be neuroaffirming and will want you to tolerate things you shouldn't have to tolerate. And it is hard to find people a lot of the time who who are the type of people you need. And I know a lot of my own clients have trauma around seeking support for their disabilities, and the very idea of trying to see another type of disability support provider can feel really inaccessible on its own. So if you are in that place, maybe this tool will help you. I know it helped me. I still don't feasibly have access to consult with an occupational therapist myself, but this has helped me a bunch. I found that working on a sensory diet for myself, and it's taking me years to figure out, you know, a routine that really works for me, it's enough that I saw a difference in how often I was having meltdowns and shutdowns. So maybe it could be helpful for you, and if it's not, you haven't done anything wrong, it might just not be the help you need right now, which I try to affirm to my clients. Like, if you try something and it is not helpful for you, or it's too hard for you to access, it is not your fault. You may need to approach things from a different perspective to get some help and relief and help yourself regulate. And the idea of being regulated, having a regulated nervous system, is not to never get overwhelmed. It's not to ever, you know, not find yourself understimulated. It is to not have yourself constantly yo-yoing between the two and spending more time in this less activated state. So we're going to talk about the senses. There are not the traditional five senses like you might have known. The sixth sense is not seeing dead people, so we're going to go over some of the senses. I know I wasn't acutely aware of these before I knew I was autistic. So each autistic person is going to have their own sensory profile of things that you either really, really seek out input for, or you might avoid input for. And I know sometimes people get labeled as sensory avoidant or sensory seeking, but it's not as easy as that because for all of us, there's going to be some sensory input we seek out and some we avoid. Even for me, I am really sensitive to sound, and it doesn't mean that I am avoiding sound at all costs. I need the right sound. And certain sounds can be really trig triggering, and I would be super reactive to them. Like, God, smoke alarm chirping, the sound of uh, stoneware dishes can burn in hell. There's so many sen there's so many sounds that I can't stand, but I also do need some sort of sound playing a lot of the time. So, each of your senses, you're going to have some sort of mix of sensory seeking and maybe sensory avoidant, and you might be considered hypersensitive to it or hyposensitive to it. So any of these senses, you're going to have to kind of figure out for yourself where you land and what you enjoy. So in the show details, I'm going to include a link to a sensory checklist from Neurodivergent Insights. It is really cool and really thorough, and you can take inventory of what you are personal sensory profile looks like, and that can kind of help you create a framework for a sensory diet for yourself. The rest of my notes will be available on our Patreon, which is one of our Patreon rewards, but I think that list of the sensory, sensory checklist is something that everyone should see. I'm going to go over the senses. There are more than five, and you might not realize that you are seeking input for some of these things. The first sense I'm going to go over, and that is the one that I seem to be sensory seeking for the most, is proprioception. Proprioception is your perception of location and movement and action of the parts of your body. It is your feeling your limbs and your body and everything and where it exists in space. It affects your perception of things like effort and heaviness as they relate to your body. So if you've ever found yourself, 
you know, oh, I grabbed this too hard and I broke this pencil, or I tried to open this bag of chips and I just ripped the fucking thing open, or I didn't push on this door hard enough. Like, those are proprioceptive senses. Simply put, it is awareness of where your body is in space. So some proprioceptive sensory activities that one might include in a sensory diet to fill your day with some positive sensory input include things like the category called heavy work. So heavy work are things that require push and pull against the body. So for me, I love working out and that is heavy work like lifting and running. Um, If you are not into the gym, that could also include things like yard work or vacuuming, or swimming, or um, hanging from a pull-up bar, or any sort of work that requires you to push and pull against your body, like intense housework, moving, that kind of stuff. Another category that provides proprioceptive input is deep pressure, and deep pressure includes things like weighted blankets, um, compressive or heavy clothing, massage, foam rolling, uh, hugging a pillow or a stuffed animal, being hugged or squeezed, or having a partner or your pet laying on you. Um, This kind of deep pressure is also one of the things that an autism service dog can provide. Um, They are very, very good boys and girls, and they can come, they know to come lay on your chest to give you that proprioceptive input when you're getting overwhelmed. And I think that is wonderful. And I love all of the working dogs. And I'm hormonal right now and I want to cry thinking about how good dogs are. But that is proprioceptive input and some sensory activities. The next sense we're going to talk about is vestibular. And that is your sense of balance, like your sense of balance and equilibrium. So vestibular input includes things like spending time on a yoga ball, a rocking chair or a hammock, spinning in a desk chair, jump rope, dancing, climbing, jumping on a trampoline, biking, skateboarding, yoga, uh, being at a standing desk, dance. So for me, vestibular input is one place where I tend to be sensory avoidant. Um, I'm a bitch who will get motion sick watching a movie. Like if you want to make me barf, just put on the Blair Witch Project. Um, And if someone is scrolling too fast on a... (laughs) on like a website and I am looking at them, that will make me motion sick. So I am not sensory seeking so much in this regard, but I know a lot of people are. So if you were a little autistic kid who liked spinning around a lot, this might be one where you really want that sensory input. The next sense we're going to go over is one of the more traditionally known senses, and that is for tactile input or touch. Tactile input is where stuff like sensory toys and fidgets come in, soft fabrics and textures, slime or Play-Doh, crochet and knitting, petting an animal, day-to-day tasks that'll include some tactile sensory input are things like baking and gardening, you know, you might have a worry stone, or kinetic sand, or calm strips, textured fabrics, um, applying lotion, massage. So for me, I've discovered I have both sensory avoidant and sensory seeking qualities for how I like my tactile input. So I get nothing out of fidget toys. Um, I know a lot of people like them, but I just, I mean, they're cool, they're fun, but I don't, I don't necessarily feel like they're helping me stay regulated and it is more It doesn't feel natural to me, so those are not things I go for. I hate to touch things like slime and certain textures like that, but oh, I am a bitch who loves lotion and massage and soft fabrics, petting a dog, and crocheting and touching a bunch of soft fabrics. So understanding the things that I like and the things I avoid has been really helpful for me figuring out what kind of tactile input makes the most sense to deliberately add to my sensory diet. Next, we're going to talk about visual sensory input. So visual stimmy things, visual sensory things can include LED lights, um, having different colored lights in the room, 
and it might include reducing certain visual input and increasing other visual input, like maybe clutter is overwhelming to you, but you like to have a very cozy room with brightly painted walls. It might include things like having a lava lamp you like staring at, having your lights on dimmers, um, stimulating decor, like art, um, and you might be someone who likes minimal decor. You might want to look at a kaleidoscope. You might enjoy staring at patterns and moving water. So those are some visual sensory things you can put in your day, and I kind of like those because those are things that can kind of stay permanent for the most part. Like, my room is my own little sensory dungeon. That sounds negative. Like a good dungeon, but not a sex dungeon. It's my little sensory dungeon where my visual stimulation is exactly what I need. And I have the colors I need. I have the patterns I like looking at. And I think for visual sensory input, I found that I like that those can be more permanent and I don't have to really actively think about them. The next type of sensory input we're going to talk about you including in a sensory diet is auditory. So auditory sensory input can look like listening to ASMR, listening to the same song on repeat. That is why I'm probably on some list with my chemical romance. I fear Gerard Way gets report. It could be listening to like white, brown, or pink noise. It could be having your noise-canceling headphones on if you really need less sensory input, but having that low hum is helpful. It could be the sounds of running water. It could be hearing the white noise from a fan or an air purifier, or the sounds of stuff like moving around um, dice or rocks. Like, we have a couple bowls of dice in our house that, oh, that sounds good, running your hands through it. It is like, it is like those gift shop rocks that you would want to, like, collect as a kid and sometimes want to eat because they look like forbidden candy. It sounds very, very good but that's auditory sensory input. The next category of sensory input you might want to incorporate into your day is gustatory. So gustatory, and I don't like it, it's oral. It's like mouth stuff, but not that kind of mouth stuff. So gustatory, like tasting, tasting stuff. Um, So for me, one of my big sources of gustatory input is uh, sparkling water. I love a fizzy drink. I love drinking sparkling water that tastes like you suggested lime from three yards away. I like hot and cold drinks, so I'm either drinking a smoothie or a tea or coffee a lot of the time. My biggest source of gustatory sensory input is hot sauce. I go through that like a motherfucker. This is one where I am extremely sensory seeking. For a lot of people, crunchy foods will kind of scratch that itch. And um, jewelry also, which I think a lot of people don't really think about, but jewelry is great because it is usually a necklace or a bracelet or something with like food grade silicone. And you can chew on that instead of wrecking your teeth on like pen caps and the strings on your hoodie and stuff. So I actually got a bunch of silicone beads and made my own jewelry to match my vibe. And you can just gnaw on that without worrying about fucking up your teeth. So that's pretty great. The next category of sensory input we're going to talk about is olfactory, or smell. So again, relating it to myself, um, I am extremely sensory seeking here in a lot of ways, but I am avoidant because if it's a smell I don't like, it, it, it will ruin my fucking day. So for me, I like to have candles and incense going. I have an essential oil diffuser. I like solid perfumes because I can take those with me places without inflicting whatever I'm smelling on everyone else. It's just like contained in a tin. If I'm going to be at home, I have perfume and some scented lotion. If I'm really going to be going all out with the self-care, I have like bubble bath and bath salts, not the drug, just the salt that goes in your bath. Um, fragrant tea or coffee is really great. But again, this is one of those things where understanding the type of sensory input that I seek and the type that I want to avoid was really helpful. Because for me, if it is something that smells like food or very sweet, um, I hate it. 
it is, I will get a headache. It's all I can think about. I can't focus on anything else. So this is one of those areas where really understanding your own sensory likes and dislikes is going to be really helpful. The final sense we're going to talk about is interoception. Now, this is not one where you so much can deliberately give yourself more sensory input because interoception are signals from your own body. It's for things like hunger, thirst, pain, emotions. So this one is not so much like, okay, now I'm going to think about how hungry I am. But for autistic people, we have traditionally have differences in our interoception. For a lot of us, we don't get the signals from our body as loudly as an holistic person might. So for me, I don't know that I'm hungry until I've passed that threshold of just simply being hungry to I am physically sick because I haven't eaten. That's the first clue I get that I'm hungry. And for a lot of us who have alexithymia, which alexithymia is characterized by having trouble naming and describing one's own emotions, that's also related to our interoception. And a lot of the time, we will get a lot of these feelings and not know exactly what they are or where they're coming from. So sometimes I'll think I am really angry and I simply haven't drank water (laughs) at all yet. It's like, oh, I drank my coffee like four hours ago and I haven't had water since and I drank water and now I'm not angry anymore. So for interoception, doing things to help myself understand what I'm feeling in my own body has really helped me because I am less overwhelmed by this seemingly random information my body is throwing to my brain. Mindfulness practices, which are not, I like, okay, I hate mindfulness meditation. So mindfulness practices do not have to be you opening up the Headspace app and having that British guy tell you to stop thinking right? Like, that's not what mindfulness is in general. There are so many different types. But for me, things like deep breathing really helps. Heavy work can help a lot with that, like working out, which is a way that I become more aware of the different parts of my body because I'm being forced to focus on them sort of one part at a time. Um, And another thing I really love is the How We Feel app. It's donation-based, so you can get it for free, but it helps to work on understanding feelings. So that one, I think, has been really a big change for me because I used an older version of it before I even knew I was autistic because my own therapist was like, I think you have trouble naming your emotions. And I like the app because all you have to do is say whether you're feeling high or low energy or negative or positive. And it gives you this graph sort of on an XY axis and you kind of wiggle around where exactly in whatever quadrant you're feeling. And it gives you names and precise definitions of emotions that live in that neighborhood of whatever you chose for how high or low energy you feel or how negative or positive you feel. And then you can journal about the physical sensations in your body that you're having when you're feeling disappointed or whatever feeling you've landed on, you have exact definitions. It asks you, you know, how did you sleep? Did you work out that day? Who were you with? That kind of stuff. So now, after using it for a prolonged amount of time, instead of beating myself up because my brain doesn't immediately tell me like, oh, you're frustrated, I have precise definitions of those feelings and I have documented the physical feelings I feel in my body when I'm feeling them. Like using that helped me figure out that I am worried sick, which I learned is not just a turn of phrase, that's a real thing. I get worried sick a lot. And now I can recognize that feeling from physical sensations in my body. And I don't have to rely on my brain actively giving me the word worried, if that makes sense. So doing things like that to help myself recognize things in my own body better. Uh, That has helped me a lot. So I don't know if it's traditionally part of a sensory diet, but I think just deciphering some of those signals you're getting from your own body, that's been really helpful for me. So in my own research into the concept of sensory diet, I discovered there were sort of two different concepts for a sensory diet that I found most helpful and I kind of worked on for myself. 
So there is a proactive sensory diet, and this is the one that is done as part of your regular sensory, like, maintenance. This helps your nervous system find more moments of regulation rather than getting stuck at either end of under or overstimulated. So for me, I see this as preventative. This is me going to go get the oil changed in my car, get the tires rotated. This is me doing the stuff to make sure I don't break down on the side of the road. And then the other type of sensory diet I found was reactive. This reactive one, is, to continue the car metaphor, is for when I get a flat tire or my check engine light is on or something is acutely actively wrong. So for me, this is when I have an acute sensory overload, when I get to what is called the rumble phase before a meltdown, and I can feel that if a single thing goes wrong, I'm going to snap. This addresses an immediate sensory overwhelm. And for me, this may, may keep me from heading toward a meltdown, and it, it doesn't always. And that's fine, because a meltdown is your sympathetic nervous system telling you you have endured enough, and it is not your fault. But if I can kind of head that off when I feel it coming, my plan sort of for reactive sensory diet stuff has been really helpful. So I thought I would share with you personal examples from my own life for what my own sort of sensory diet looks like, because I know I can talk about positive sensory input and the concept, but hearing how it actively works in another person's life is probably going to be helpful so you can get an idea of what that looks like. For me, doing a lot of proactive sensory diet stuff has helped me really reduce the number of meltdowns and shutdowns I was having. And I have things I do throughout the day that I would probably say are part of the proactive part, but I have a whole evening routine that I do every single day, at least most parts of it every single day, to help me wind down and calm down so I can actually sleep better. <laughs> and uh, that one has been so helpful. Not only do I have routine, but I know that that part of my routine, which consequently is part of taking care of my human body, I know that is filled with a bunch of positive sensory input that's going to help me. And I really like to think of the end of my day as setting me up for a better tomorrow, because I know if I get too overwhelmed before bed, I will not sleep well, and I will carry all of that overwhelm and overload into the next day with me. So this really helps me sort of tamp down some of whatever has happened during the day and prepare myself for tomorrow. So whenever I am done with work for the day, I work out. I know not everyone can work out. Um, I know not everyone enjoys working out, but I love, I love the gym. Um, I like lifting weights, and five days a week I will be working out for sometimes sometimes two hours because I get a little hyper focused and I, I like picking up heavy things. Working out right after work gives me proprioceptive and vestibular input. If I'm feeling a particular song, it might even be a time for audio stimming. So I will be lifting weights and just actively feeling the feel and the burn in different parts of my body also helps me with my interoception because I am made to be more acutely aware of different parts of my body and that really helps me connect more to my physical presence, be a little more embodied because I might have been overwhelmed during the day and it helps me be more aware. After my workout comes shower time and I know a lot of autistic people have trouble taking a shower I am not one of them. I would often get in trouble for showering or taking uh, too long of baths as a kid because that was my favorite. I loved it and I have to actively make myself get out. So again, this is my part of my personal evening routine. It is made to my sensory profile, so that might not be the thing for you. But after my workout time, after getting my sick gains, comes my shower. I have a Bluetooth speaker in my shower, which adds the auditory stim in there too because... Most of the time, it's probably My Chemical Romance, I won't lie to you. But the Bluetooth speaker also helps me make sure I am not in there too long, because I have a certain length playlist, so I know that I am not wasting a bunch of water. But anyway, so Bluetooth speaker has auditory stim time. Shower time has olfactory and tactile stims, too. So I have my favorite Lush body wash. I have my very good smelling everything in the shower. There are tactile stems because I like things that are good textures. 
Um, my shower needs to be so hot that you think I will melt like one of those guys at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's how hot I need my shower. So that provides me some proprioceptive input too because, god, I want a hot shower. After my shower comes my skincare routine. Now, this part is extensive because skincare and dermatology are one of my special interests, and this is a full-body skincare routine for me. It is extra. I spend about an hour each night chilling while I do this. I feel silly like I'm preening like a bird in my room, but it is so good, and I love it, and I get to spend a full hour just taking care of my human body. And this also helps me with my interoception more, I feel. It makes me have to pay attention to my body, which is kind of helpful for someone who lifts as much as I do, um, because I might not realize that I overdid it. Maybe I have a joint that hurts. Um, I might not realize that until I'm really, really hurt uh, historically, but having my full skincare routine, making myself do all that, I I found that I don't do that as often because I am more aware of, oh, that knee is kind of sore. I need to take it easy tomorrow. Or my ankle, I overdid it, my ankle's kind of hurting after doing squats. So that helps my interoception too, which is not something I anticipated. But my full body skincare routine takes me about an hour because I'm a little princess and I deserve it. It provides tactile and proprioceptive input. I often have a candle or incense going at the same time for olfactory input. And bonus points for gustatory input if I have sparkling water or tea or something yummy to munch on while I'm doing that. After my skincare routine comes either like foam roller and stretching or uh, the newest addition to my evening routine, my mini Theragun, which was a pricey thing, but I also got that because I have endometriosis and that'll help my back. But yeah, foam rolling, stretching, Theragun provide both proprioceptive and vestibular input. The next part is, I don't know if it technically counts toward the sensory diet part, but I usually have one of my comfort TV shows playing. I am one of those autistic people who watches the same things over and over and over again since literally since I was an infant. I completely destroyed a couple VHSs like uh, 101 Dalmatians and Mrs. Doubtfire and a recording of the 1977 Barishnikov Nutcracker that I was really obsessed with. I watched them so much I ruined the tapes. So as an adult, while I am doing my skincare routine, I am usually watching Buffy or Star Trek. They are both special interests. They chill me out. So another component of this is compressive clothing and weighted blanket. So my uniform generally consists of leggings and bike shorts, sports bra, and a big old t-shirt. Uh, compressive clothing provides me proprioceptive input, and chilling out for the evening and crawling under my weighted blanket also does the same thing. So that's really the gist of my proactive sensory diet routine I have in the evenings. Now, I'm going to talk about my reactive sensory diet. So when I feel like I am overwhelmed and overloaded, like I'm going to snap, I turn to my reactive sensory diet sort of game plan. And I've done it so much that even when I am super overwhelmed, I think my brain kind of automatically knows now, okay, let's do these things to help you. So... I do all of this when I get to that rumble phase before a meltdown, and that's where I am repeating myself. I'm usually asking a lot of questions. I'll be pacing. I find myself making really tight fists with my hands. And these are all things I've had to learn over time mean that I'm about to have a meltdown, right? So I'll get really irritable, and it'll be seemingly out of nowhere, and it's never out of nowhere. And that's when I know I should probably stop what I'm doing if I can and try to do my reactive sensory diet stuff. So the first thing I do, if I don't already have them on, is put on my noise-canceling headphones. So when I get to the rumble phase of a meltdown, every single sound, even the sounds of my own body moving around, those add to my overwhelm. So I'll put on my noise-canceling headphones, and if I am not too far gone, on the path to a meltdown, I have a few ASMR videos that don't have any talking, and my brain seems to find those really calming. And if I don't have the capacity to open YouTube to get to my save videos, I am more likely to have the capacity to open up Spotify and just click on this like nine hours of pink noise that I have saved on Spotify. So that positive auditory input really helps me. The next thing I do is rocking back and forth and sitting on the floor while I'm hugging a pillow, 
which is very specific, but again, I've collected a lot of data on myself, and this is something I've developed over time. So I naturally seem to want to sit on the floor when I am on my way to a meltdown. Um, I also find this helpful because when I have a meltdown, I am prone to self-injurious stims, which I know are not a topic people really like to talk about, but when I have a meltdown, I am very likely to hit myself, or I might even bite my hand or squeeze my fist so hard that I have nail marks in my palms. So sitting on the floor, and I actually learned this from Sesame Street from Cookie Monster. Uh, was it Cookie Monster? I don't think it was Cookie Monster. There was some, okay, I was looking up stuff about meltdowns, and there was some sensory post where someone from Sesame Street talked about just sitting on your hands, too. Um, I did that at first, and then I discovered that hugging and squeezing a pillow sort of helped me uh, redirect those self-injurious stems. So, rocking back and forth, sitting on the floor, hugging a pillow. I usually have my headphones on at this point, so I am doing all of that while listening to some nice British lady gently crinkle plastic wrap over a Yeti microphone. It took me a while to start naturally rocking back and forth because that was a stim that I had suppressed for a very long time, but that's one of the ones that I found has kind of come back. So when I am trying to do my reactive sensory diet, I, I have to consciously tell myself like, hey, rocking back and forth will help, but then it just kind of happens, if that makes sense. So that's one that I didn't initially do, but has kind of come back over time. So the third part of my reactive sensory diet is proprioceptive input I get from a weighted blanket or a vest. Now, I know they make weighted vests, right? I do not own one. I am a simple gay little punk, and I have a bunch of very heavy vests that I just wear that are weighted down with a bunch of patches and shit. So those provide me with deep pressure in themselves, and I have never bought a weighted vest. But if that is not your aesthetic, they also make weighted vests for this exact thing. But when I am sitting on the floor, hugging a pillow, which hugging a pillow gives me the proprioceptive input too. It doesn't just redirect those uh, self-injurious stims. It actually gives me proprioceptive input. So that and the weighted blanket and my vest give me more proprioceptive input. So, yeah, that is my reactive sensory diet that I do. And there are other proactive things I do throughout my day that are maybe not routine, like my evening routine, but they're things that I try to include during the day while I'm working just to help myself in general. And I found that these things actually, I feel like, help my ADHD and help me focus more, too. So that's been helpful. But I take a lot of movement breaks during the day. So I deliberately have 30-minute gaps between my clients, and this is to give me some transition time because autistic inertia is real, and it makes switching between clients less jarring, and I feel like I am going to be better at peer support and coaching if I get enough transition time between clients, and I can kind of recalibrate, and that really helps me. And my movement breaks that I get done in these times include things like stretching, foam rolling, I might just pace around while I listen to a podcast. I have a stationary bike that I got for free that folds up that I have in my room, and I might hop on that for a little bit. I have a hula hoop, which I fucking love hula hooping, um, and I might just dance around with the dogs, but this provides me with proprioceptive and vestibular input, and you can tell I am very sensory seeking for proprioceptive input, so that's, for my personal sensory profile, this is what makes the most sense for me. Also, olfactory input. So while I'm working, I have candles and incense. I have that solid perfume at my desk that I told you about. I have room spray for my room. I do all of my work for my room so I can make it as good stinky as I want without inflicting it on everyone else in the house. And I also have my weighted blanket and a pillow for my lap. So while I'm at my desk working and seeing clients, I most of the time either have a weighted blanket in my lap or if it is too hot for that, I will have a pillow on my lap, and this provides me more proprioceptive input, and I've noticed I can really actually focus better, like I'm better at my job. And finally, for auditory input, if I am not editing audio or actively with a client, I will have my noise-canceling headphones on, and I am either listening to pink noise or ASMR. I need that auditory input. It not only gives me the positive sensory input, but... 
both my partners also work from home, so I will get easily distracted by hearing them, you know, in the kitchen doing stuff or maybe accidentally hearing them talking on the phone to someone, so that actually helps my ADHD also. That is the concept of sensory diet, and like I said, I am not an occupational therapist. I am just someone who needed some fucking relief and didn't have anywhere to go or the resources to pay someone to talk to or any of that when I first learned I was autistic and I was really desperate to reduce the number of meltdowns I was having. Um, I was so burnt out, they were almost daily. And incorporating very slowly and figuring out what worked for me, but incorporating uh, deliberate stuff to create my own sensory diet has really, really helped. So if you are in the same boat and you don't have the capacity to go talk to someone and find an occupational therapist and you don't think you have the capacity to rediscover stims because they don't feel natural and honestly it's not safe for a lot of people to stim freely in public or even at home but a lot of these things won't read as overtly autistic so if you're not in a space where you are safe to be overtly autistic a lot of these things could be really helpful for you and I hope you can find things to help yourself, to incorporate into your day, to build into your routines. Because I know when you are late recognized autistic, you are realizing you are likely autistic because you are reaching a point where it is unavoidable and you are burnt out and you finally have an answer for why things are so hard. And I know things get difficult, but they do get better. And if you can learn how to take care of your autistic nervous system, it helps a lot. So thanks for listening to my solo dump. If you start incorporating some of these things into your day and you just want to show them to me, um, please go find me. I'm usually on Instagram and just like, let me know. I want to see what cool stuff you found that helps you out during your day. you've reached the housekeeping section and it might be the housekeeping section of today's lucky winner and it might be the housekeeping section of info dumpies because i am recording a housekeeping section far in advance because we are going to be moving and i want to be able to have all of these episodes still coming out while we're moving but i also do need to pack up things in my recording center station in my room and i don't want to record bad audio for y'all so this housekeeping section is going to be the same for probably a couple of months. I usually like to wait to record these until closer to the episode uh, because I want our Patreon shoutout people to be up to date and accurate. But I think y'all understand that you'll get more episodes this way and we don't have to pause anything and make you wait longer. And as soon as I'm able to record these closer to the date, um, I'm going to start doing that again. But in the meantime, here's the housekeeping section for a show. So if you like the episode of whatever show you're listening to at the moment, uh, check out the episode details to find everyone's social media handles. You can find Mixnomer on uh, Instagram at the handle Mixnomer Productions. If you're listening to today's lucky winner, all of the cast have their social media handles in the episode details so you can see what we're doing on the interwebs. Um, and if you want to support us, the best way you can do that is by sharing about the show. We don't pay for ads, and we don't take paid ads, so you sharing the show is the way we grow. Like, word of mouth is the way we grow uh, any of our shows. So if you want to tell someone in your Discord server, in your subreddit, in the grocery store, I don't know, anywhere, you tell someone about it. It helps us out a lot. If you are in a place to help us monetarily, you can find a link to our Patreon for Mix Nelmer in the show details. So when you become a Patreon subscriber, you are subscribing to get content for any and all shows we make in perpetuity, uh, and you get to support everything we do. It gets split among our cast members because we do profit sharing and we try to make sure that everyone essentially gets the same hourly rate for their work. 
So when you become a Patreon supporter, starting at the $1 level, you can get access to our Discord server, where we do things like streams where we play Jackbox games, streams where you watch me and Violet play a video game together, I do body doubling, I started doing like a little stitch and bitch hour where we do uh, different fiber arts and we just chat. It's like a virtual knitting circle. It's very fun. But when you do that, it's just at the dollar level. You get access to all of that. And then at higher levels, you get access to things like music from Today's Lucky Winner and live recordings of our Today's Lucky Winner episodes and all of the notes from me and Violet and our guests that they make for uh, Info Dumpies episodes that have a bunch of links so you can go learn more about a subject that you heard on an episode of Info Dumpies. There's lots of cool stuff, and when you support us on Patreon at certain levels, you can also get a cool shout out, like our friends Randy Lovings, Rachel Rachelson, Sewing Seraph, B. Trossler, Smurdy Singh, Helen Clifford, M. Mosin, Lucy, and Nicole Valdivieso. And if you haven't yet, it would be really helpful for us if you left a rating and a nice review to let people know that you liked our shows. Um, It helps us get higher in recommendations and on different charts and get recommended to more people. Um, Subscribing also does that and it costs you nothing and that helps us out a lot. So if you would like to support us in another way, that's another way you can help us out. But yeah, hopefully I will be having my recording set up at our new house when we get moved to, we're moving from Texas to Minneapolis, so that's going to be a big change. Um, But once we get settled in Minneapolis and I have my recording station set up, these housekeeping sections will be bespoke per episode of show again, I promise. I feel bad cutting corners and I feel bad that there's some people who might, um, who might join our Patreon between now and then, who might not get their shout-out immediately, but again, I would rather get you shows in a timely manner than worry about that too much. I'm trying to not let my perfectionism take over. But that's all I got for you, little buddies. Um, God, if you listen to Info Dumpies and you don't listen to Today's Lucky Winner, calling you little buddies sounds condescending, um, but I promise it's not. But that's all I got for you now, little buddies. Until next time, Try not to die. And if you're an Info Dumpies listener and you don't listen to Today's Lucky Winner, um, my ending is... That's my ending. Okay. Sorry. <laughs>